Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the session, um, Innovative Uses of Islandora. My name is Mark Jordan. I'm from Simon Fraser University. Um, I'll introduce uh, um, my colleagues briefly uh, and then move into an introduction and then hand it over to the first speaker. Um, this is Christian Allen from UCLA and Evelyn McClellan from Artifactual Systems. Um, Islandora is a, uh, a general repository platform built on kind of commonly known and, and well understood tools, namely Drupal, Fedora Commons, and Solar for searching. Uh, and it's um, currently uh, using Fedora 3 and Drupal 7. That's kind of changing as we speak. There's a movement right now to migrate to Fedora 4. You may have heard a lot of buzz about F Fedora 4. Um, it has a very vibrant user community and a fairly vibrant uh, commercial support community. There are at least three commercial service providers. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> Actually, can someone close the door at the back, please? That helps a lot. Thanks. And as far as we know, uh, in, within the Islandora community, it's installed in a production, uh, production environment in about 100 sites around the world, uh, mainly North America, quite a few in Europe, and a sprinkling in Eurasia. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Christian now and let him take the microphone. Sure, thank you. Um, so as Mark mentioned, my name is Christian Allen. I'm a software developer at uh, UCLA. Um, and we use Islandora um, in a variety of different projects. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about today, um, just covering briefly what Mark already said, just Islandora in general to get everybody on the same page if you're not familiar with it or you're looking at using it. Um, how particular code packages are used in Islandora um, and how other people others in the community can contribute to the open source um, software that so others can use particular um, projects uh, and then I'll focus on a use case at UCLA and a particular um, module that we contributed uh, along with DGI uh, the discovery garden a vendor um, back to the Islandora community. Um, and so as Mark mentioned, this is just a high level view of what uh, Islandora is. It uses three main components that if um, you're already familiar with just the software world and, and repository in general, these are all really common. Uh, Drupal, which is a popular CMS framework, is used uh, to view objects uh, on the web. Uh, Solar is used for the browse and discovery layer, um, so this is used to search the, the contents of the repository, and Fedora is used for long-term storage um, and archiving of, the, of the objects. Um, so we're going to focus um, particularly in Drupal. Uh, there's the concept of modules, which are just reusable packages of uh, code uh, that um, apply to a certain use case. Um, and Islandora has adopted this concept and called uh, the chunks of code that they use solution packs. Um, so th this is just a fancy way of saying it's a, um, uh, a way to uh, package code so others may use it um, in a different environment. So someone um, at XYZ organization develops something um, and someone at ABC organization wants to use that. Um, there's just a standard uh, way of structuring the code so that others can use it easily. Um, and so Islandora has the concept of solution packs, so if you have um, a digital library, most likely you're doing the same things over and over again. Uh, if you want to display audio, um, there's a um, most likely you're using the same player as someone else, or if you're using video, you're structuring the data a certain way. Um, and out of the box, uh, Islandora comes with uh, a variety of different components to get you started. Um, one of the areas that we were interested in were, was particularly um, a manuscript uh, collection that we wanted to uh, expose on the web. And there wasn't a, a turnkey solution. Um, if you're familiar with Islandora, there's a, a variety of, of similar uh, solution packs. So for example, there's the book solution pack. Um, and there's a newspaper solution pack, which were very close uh, to what we were looking to use in a particular project, but they weren't quite there. There was a couple features that 
that we needed. Um, and so it's just a matter of adopting these um, and then um, creating um, a solution pack and then um, using this in the Islandora framework. Um, and so our particular uh, use case that we had, uh, we had a need for the, a manuscript solution pack. So it, um, essentially, um, there was a couple different features that the book solution pack and a newspaper solution pack didn't have. And, and in, in particular, this was um, TI association and uh, a custom XSLT display. Um, and also the option to view and compare multiple images uh, of, of a work. Um, and there uh, were already, there's a, it, the Islandora community had developed um, the Digital Humanities Solution Pack, which was a little too heavyweight, we thought, for our needs. We needed to scale it down and just wanted to start with something a, a little more simple. And it should be noted that there are others in the Islandora community, um, particularly Hamilton College, that did a lot of work with TEI um, and um, papers uh, with their Civil War project, um, but it was done in a previous version of Islandora, um, and we're using um, Islandora 7, so we weren't we were able to utilize some of the concepts, but we were able to port the code directly. Um, so the first feature that that we uh, were really interested in was um, building on um, the the Internet Archive Viewer um, and the Book Viewer Solution Pack. So out of the box, uh, the Book Solution Pack of Islandora uses the, the Internet Archive Viewer, which everybody knows and is familiar with and is a really robust viewer. Um, we needed the option to actually have a TEI text compared with um, a page that the user was looking at. Um, but if, if um, TI didn't exist for a project, we didn't want to um, force, the, force a user or force a project to have to have TDI, a T, TEI to use this project. So um, you have the option of choosing between two different viewers right now. Um, the Internet Archive Viewer, if you just want to get started right out of the gate and you don't have um, any, any TEI or, or additional components. Or if you do have TEI and some XSLT for your project, um, you can use a custom viewer that uh, UCLA has uh, that allows you to put these two pieces side by side um, and uh, interact with the TEI. So when you, when you choose a page, the, the actual image changes to, to where you are um, in, re in um, reference to the TEI. Um, along with that is previously in Islander, there wasn't a way to associate a TEI file with um, a uh, manuscript or, or book collection, um, and now uh, one is able to do that. Um, and uh, the, the advantage of that is now that you can you can take advantage of, of TEI related functions that were, were not previously available. Um, along with that, you're going to want to display this TEI in a certain way, and that's going to be different for every project. Uh, and so the way that that's uh, utilized is using XSLT. So um, for each project, um, no manuscript uh, most likely is going to, uh, you're going to have an 18th century manuscript is, is going to look completely different from something from present day. And you'll want to display these differently. And that's um, done via XSLT. So you can use the same code, same solution pack. Um, and someone on your team can just develop one new file, an XSLT, um, and you can have a completely different viewer um, that's more appropriate for, for your project. Um, so the particular case study that we're using this for first is the David Livingstone project, and David Livingstone was a, a Scottish explorer, um, and he kept extensive writings of his travels uh, in Africa, and we have um, hundreds of, of documents of, uh, and um, manuscripts during this period and these been these have all been marked up in TEI and transcribed by scholars um, and we have implemented this uh, in in Islandora uh, so this is a, a completely Islandora site uh, utilizing the manuscript viewer that we had just um, reviewed um, and it's uh, directed by Professor Wisnicki at University of Lincoln uh, Nebraska uh, UCLA is the digital host and publisher, um, and we're working closely with um, resources at UNL to um, 
bring this project to fruition and it's going it's in beta now and it's going live in um, at the end of May um, so this is just an example of, of uh, a, a screen capture of uh, the manuscript view of a particular letter um, in the, the Livingstone project. Um, there's also all the standard features of Islandora, uh, which is a faceted browse uh, by different um, authors and topics um, and places that the um, letters were written. And also what's really particularly interesting about this collection is um, while uh, Livingstone was in Africa, he had very limited uh, access to paper and would write uh, on um, newspaper um, uh, from left to right, right to left, up and down. Um, and he also utilized, um, after he ran out of ink, he utilized ink uh, created from the local berries. Um, and so using spectral imaging, um, you can now see uh, the different writings a lot more clear where it looks just like a mishmash if you just look at the paper um, and those resources are also in there and there is you can be able to you're able to compare um, these uh, the next step for this project is we'd like to increase the um, TI and viewer interaction right now it's fairly rudimentary you can change a page and um, it will flip to the next uh, um, the appropriate um, uh, the appropriate uh, image that you're looking for. But we'd like to have it linkable um, and um, using OCR, some of the, um, be able to dig into the, uh, the, uh, the material um, a, a lot more robustly. Uh, we do need a generic batch ingest process. So right now this is, it, you have to ingest this um, for your organization, but um, we'd like to have this a generic process so you can just dump things in a folder and it will um, ingest it into um, Islandor and um, generate the uh, proper derivatives. Um, additional navigation widgets, um, annotation options, and additional integration with other viewers out there, such, a, such as Miradora and some of the other um, projects, interesting projects out there. And we have a public release in May. Um, we're running out of time, but I'll just cover. So, so, so the um, additional features of the manuscript solution pack. So right now, I've just focused on its use in um, manuscripts, but there's a. Um, it's really meant for archival materials in general, um, and so if you have an EAD um, finding aid, you can ingest it using this solution pack, and it will automatically generate um, something akin to a site map, uh, a large uh, linked page um, that you can also customize via XSLT. Um, and so the idea would be um, if you had just large content that you wanted to churn out quickly um, and didn't have metadata at the item layer, um, this, this is a, a solution that you um, that you could explore um, that would be able to get a lot of content up quickly. Um, a standard review is provided, so um, depending on your finding aid, if it's you know folder box item or um, the way it's it's structured, uh, there's just a default way to look at this, um, and then you can tweak that using um, XSLT for for your organization. Um, so these are just the final the people and contributors. Um, and uh, the, the item or the uh, solution pack is available on GitHub right now um, and is downloadable and usable. Um, and UCLA has a, a fork that we're using for the David Livingston project, but anything generic, we plan to contribute back to um, submit pull requests and, and, and submit that back to the Discovery Garden and Islandora repo for use. Um, and so, that's um, that's about it. Thank you. No, oh, I'm fine. So I'm Evelyn McClellan, uh, president of Artifactual Systems. We develop open source software for libraries and archives. The two tools that we develop are Archivematica, which is a backend digital preservation system, and Atom, which is a web-based access system aimed uh, mainly at archives, and it supports archival hierarchical description and display. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about uh, a module that integrates Islandora and Archivematica. And this is work that was funded by the University of Saskatchewan. They had both Islandora and Archivematica, but the two systems didn't speak to each other, so they had Islandora for 
uh, you know, digital uh, object deposit, management of the repository, display, and that kind of thing. And they were also running uh, digital holdings through Archivematica to create archival information packages for long-term preservation, but they wanted, they wanted uh, materials that were ingested into Island Dora to be uh, preserved in Archivematica. So you know what Island Dora is, it basically it's a digital object repository, it, uh, it has a set of interfaces for doing metadata entry, uh, it does digital object display in various ways, and it, it's a collection management system and a, a storage system. I mainly put that up there because it's, it con contrasts with the next slide which talks a little bit more about Archivematica and you can see that the two systems have very different functionality. So Archivematica, the focus is digital preservation and it ingests bodies of digital objects, different types of digital objects, digitized holdings, born digital holdings, audio, video files, office files, uh, uh, forensic disks, a number of different types of holdings. Uh, it performs a bunch of preservation microservices and it also has functionality to normalize to preservation formats. It generates premise in METS XML files, and that's probably one of the key functionalities of Archivematica, is it has this very uh, robust capability to, capability to generate preservation and technical metadata, uh, generate premise metadata and events and agents and rights. It has a very rich and detailed premise implementation, and it packages that all up in a METS file. So Archivematica produces archival information packages, which are, are fairly uh, generic, and they're transparent and self-documenting, and they're meant to be very system independent. And then they place, uh, then Archivematica places the archival information packages into long-term storage, and it's fairly neutral about what kind of long-term storage that is. Archivematica isn't a storage management system. It, it simply creates these archival information packages to put into archival storage. So Archidora, University of Saskatchewan contracted with Artifactual Systems and with Discovery Garden to create the functionality in both systems uh, to speak to each other and then Discovery Garden released the Archidora plugin uh, a little bit earlier this year. The, the functionality, the plugin is complete but uh, Archivematica is, is still in beta for this where actually the functionality will be released and complete uh, with the release of Archivematica 1.4, which we're hoping to do later this month. So it's very close to being ready. So this is a basic look at the workflow. Archivematica actually integrates with other access and deposit systems, and there's a couple of different ways that it can happen. Uh, you can ingest content into Archivematica, generate dissemination information packages, and then upload those dissemination information packages to access systems. In this case, the workflow is the other way. The holdings go into Islandora, and then Archivematica works on the back end um, to, to preserve the content that is coming in from Islandora. So what happens is that Islandora continues to act as the access system and uh, Archivematica is creating the archival, archival information packages in the background. So that's the basic overview. Files are added to Islandora. They, Archivematica retrieves them from Fedora and then sends back a notification to Islandora saying that the archival information packages have been generated and everything's okay. That's the more detailed view, and I'm, I'm not going to go over it in a lot of detail. That's actually one of the design documents. So basically, the workflow is that the user or multiple users are depositing content into Islandora, and Fedora content validation triggers a call to Archivematica. So you can have multiple users working on multiple collections, and ingest is happening automatically into Archivematica per collection. So what you can do is you configure the Archidora plugin to say, you know, what kind of archival information package do you want? Do you want, you know, how large do you want these packages, for example? So what happens is that whenever this content validation is occurring, um, Islandora sends a message to Archivematica 
saying that, that this content validation has occurred, and then Archivematica goes and gets the Fedora METS file. It looks at the METS file, it parses the information, and it goes back to Islandora, and it fetches the digital object stream and the MODS file, and ingests it into to Archivematica. And this is an ongoing process until a certain limit is reached, which is specified by the user. So let's say the user is saying, you know, when there's 20 gigabytes of content in, in a certain collection, then that triggers the creation of, of a transfer to Archivematica. So Archivematica stops gathering and actually creates a transfer that's ready for processing in Archivematica. So at that <coughs> point, um, Archivematica verifies the checksums that are coming in from the Fedora METS file. And if everything is okay, then it's uh, the transfer comes up in the Archivematica dashboard and the user can then go in and improve the, st approve the start of the transfer. So at this point, all the digital preservation microservices kick in, the content gets processed, the archive archival information package is created and placed in storage, and then Archivematica sends the uh, uh, completion status to Islandora and says, okay, the archival, informa ar archival information package has been created and the content is safely stored. So I'm just going to show you uh, a manual process for this because it, it sort of helps um, to illustrate exactly what's happening here. So you have, you have an image collection in Islandora, for example. And there's a the detail. So what I did is I just went into our, our Islandora Archivematica test instance and just manually sort of had Archivematica in just a single digital object. So if you were to click on the Manage tab on that screen, you would see there's actually an Archivematica link there along with all of the other things that you can do to manage this object. So you click on that and you, you tell Archivematica to ingest this file and you get a message saying this has been successfully submitted to Archivematica. So once you've done that and you have all your content, then Archivematica does its thing. And I don't know how familiar you are with Archivematica, but that's basically one of the tabs that is showing you all the uh, results and outputs of all the, the various preservation microservices that are happening. So in this case, you can see that there's a check mark next to the, the houses in Strathcona there. That's saying, okay, everything's been done. We've run through all the microservices. Everything is successful. Um, if it weren't successful, you would see red and you would see error message and you would be emailed an error message and that kind of thing. And it has uh, successfully been placed into archival storage, which is good. Um, th this is what Canadians look like when we're pleased. <laughs> <laughs> So at this point, you can go, I mean, this is just for demonstration purposes, but you can go, you can retrieve the, the digital object from archival storage using the Archivematica archival storage tab. And you can see there that this particular archival information package consists of th just this one picture. Um, and you can see the reference to the data stream. You can see the reference to the archival information package. So the Archivematica archival information package is a very simple um, folder structure that is bagged up in the Library of Congress bag it format. If you want it to be, actually, you don't have to, um, but it is bagged and compressed in most cases. So there you can just see that's a very typical bag it format if you're familiar with it. Um, within the data folder, we have the Archivematica METS file, which is uh, fairly huge, actually, it's amazing. Even for a single digital object, if you were to open the, the METS file, it would be very large. It would have uh, a, a bunch of extracted technical metadata. It would have all the premise events, everything that had happened to it in Archivematica. It would have agents. It might have uh, other metadata that you added during processing. So the, the Islandora METS file, the, the Fedora METS file, I should say, has also been ingested and packaged into the archival information package. And you can see there's a folder for the mods file as well. 
So the, the mods file that was in Islandora has been ingested and uh, some of the contents of the mods file have been parsed to the Archivematica METS file and you can search for this particular object using the mods identifier. So you can search for that in Archivematica, for example. So Archivematica has sent uh, a status update to Islandora and if you go back into Islandora, here I've just gone into the collection as a whole and it's showing me all the objects that have been ingested into Archivematica and successfully stored as archival information packages. So at this point, you can choose to, to go ahead and delete the original content that was deposited into Islandora because Islandora creates uh, derivatives for display. Some institutions don't want to keep the potentially very large master digital objects in Islandora. They just want to keep derivatives and they want to store the masters in Archivematica. So at this point, you have the ability to go through and, and delete content, d delete the original uh, object data streams and just keep the derivatives. Actually, at the beginning, we had thought, well, what if we just want that done automatically? And, and as soon as Archivematica sends the message, everything gets deleted. Um, but uh, University of Saskatchewan got very nervous about that possibility and decided that it, it wanted to have an approval step, which is pretty understandable. So as I mentioned, I mean, what I showed you there was sort of a manual process, but this can happen very automatically. So you can have Archivemata, Archivematica running in the background. You can be depositing a lot of content into Islandora, and these uh, ingest processes can be triggered automatically. Anyway, it's all up on GitHub. Uh, the, the module itself was developed by Discovery Garden. As I mentioned, it requires Archivematica 1.4, which hasn't been released yet, but which will be released later this month. There's a lot of, there's a lot more we could do. There are, uh, we could parse more of the METS content. We could ingest the premise that's coming out of the Fedora METS file and actually parse it to the Archivematica METS file. One of the other things that we could do is, I mentioned that the workflow is basically you ingest into our, to Islandora and the content ends up in Archivematica. We would love to be able to do it the other way so that if you have a bunch of holdings in Archivematica, you could create dissemination information packages and push them to Islandora. We always want the, the workflow to work both ways so it doesn't tie the institution to always uh, doing everything in, in one way in a particular linear order. Um, and of course, you may have Archivematica for years before you get Islandora, and then you want to push all your content to Islandora. So that's uh, development that awaits funding. Um, and so uh, basically watch this space is what I'm saying about that part of it. And uh, that's it. So I'm going to talk about my library's migration to Islandora. Uh, and uh, you may be asking, what's so innovative about a migration? We all do them. They're fairly common, if not routine. Um, there's not a lot innovative about our migration, except that we are being forced to, we're, we have a lot of things. We have 1.3 million objects in our current reposi general repository system. It's a content DM repository. And the size of that migration is forcing us to be innovative in certain ways. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, we also are developing a lot of tools during in preparation for and, and for after the migration. And as Christian's already alluded, um, Islandora is fairly modular, uh, kind of following in the pattern set by Drupal. And it's got a, a very open backend. Fedora Commons is completely open with APIs that you can do interesting things with. So this is allowing us to create a lot of new modules, solution packs, and, and, and miscellaneous tools for Islandora uh, to help meet our needs, again, prior to, during, and after the migration. And we're going to talk about a few of those things in detail. Uh, and I'll be talking about why we're migrating, um, what I'm calling our migration use cases, some things that are special to us, although they could be uh, the case with other sites as well. Um, talk about our metadata mapping and conversion process and tools, and then talk about two or three um, of the other tools that we're developing and we'll be releasing uh, to the community for their use if they can find a use for them. So why we're migrating. Um, we've been using ContentDM for a number of years and it's served us fairly well, but it's not very flexible at all. 
and we need a we need a much more flexible repository platform to do things like to start automating workflows, so to move content between uh, tools and, and repository pla and platforms. Uh, we need to um, uh, we can't do that with content jam at the moment. Uh, it's impossible to automate. Uh, my library tends to favor open source solutions, uh, particularly when there's good or better than the commercial alternatives. And we already use uh, Islandora in a, uh, another repository that's fairly new. Uh, it's called Radar. It's our research data repository. And Brian Owen uh, talked about it in this room yesterday uh, afternoon. Uh, our institutional repository is a straight up Drupal site. It's not Islandora, it's just Drupal. Um, but we have over 10,000 objects in that repository, mainly theses, but also a lot of ePrints and preprints. And uh, we are a Drupal shop. Uh, we run our two main websites on Drupal, and we have probably half a dozen other Drupal based websites of various kinds. So we want to standardize that platform, and Islandora is giving us an opportunity to do that. These migration use cases I mentioned a minute ago, again, uh, one of the most important and challenging is the size of our migration. Uh, 1.3 million things in content DM, 900,000 of which are newspaper pages. So we have a pretty big collection of newspapers. Uh, and that's significant for a migration to Islandora because when you ingest newspapers into Islandora, it takes a long time <laughs> because it, it runs each TIFF image, each page image through uh, an OCR process. It converts from TIFF to JPEG 2000 and it, it just takes quite a while. It would, it would for any system, um, but it does take quite a while in Islandora. Something, uh, I'll explain this in a few minutes in de more detail, but uh, ContentDM provides a web, an HTTP API. You can query it via a, a URL, and you can get information about objects in, in ContentDM via uh, a URL. And we have taken advantage of this by building a, a Drupal module uh, in a few years ago that uh, is the front end for a set of collections in ContentDM within a Drupal website. Um, and because of that, we have two, two of our other Drupal websites I mentioned a minute ago are Multicultural Canada and the Komagatamaru journey. Um, so we have two kind of boutique websites or websites that consume content that's in ContentDM in a Drupal website. And uh, we don't have time or resources to convert those to Islandora now. So we need a way to Again, I'll describe this in detail in a minute, but we need a way to kind of swap out that AP, the content DM API and make the sites think that they're talking to content DM, in essence. We are, really want to preserve the old URLs in content DM so that uh, when, so we don't have to go back and update them, not only in our own internal systems like our integrated library system, but anyone who's linked to a, a URL in content DM, we want them to be automatically rerouted to the, the new version of that object in Islandora. And there are a number of uh, collections we have that uh, are of a content type, so to speak, that is not s currently supported in Islandora. So we need to address that particular need as well. Uh, so central to this migration is converting all the metadata that we have to describe these 1.3 million things into mods, which is the out-of-the-box metadata schema used by Islandora. Uh, and so we need to map from the content DM metadata to, to mods. Uh, and that's a fairly uh, routine process. We are developing a tool to help us do that uh, in a flexible, modular sort of way. Uh, but one challenge we have is that we have some collections that can't map to mods. They don't, the collections don't describe or contain book-like things. They, they're basically biographical databases. So we have a solution pack that we've developed to address that, and I'll describe it in a few minutes. And during the migration, we're going to take the opportunity, like many people do, to clean up some of the, the uh, metadata we have. We haven't been terribly consistent over the years for various reasons, some of them legitimate, some of them not so legitimate, in creating our metadata. And things like date formatting are particularly easy to clean up during a migration. Um, we have a lot of collections that are owned by faculty. And they were never interested in 
adhering to the library standards or even library world's kind of view of metadata descriptions, they have their own special view of how to describe the items in their collections. And so they just make up, they make up metadata elements to best suit their research needs and their community's needs. Uh, so we have another challenge and that is how do you map those kinds of metadata structures into a, a library specific, domain specific structure like mods. And uh, kind of the outcome of the migration is to develop a kind of a single library wide metadata profile with specific profiles for different kinds of collections uh, in, in our repository. So a couple of slides to just show kind of how we're doing this. Um, in Content DM, you have, for each collection, it allows you to configure the metadata the way that you want, uh, largely based on, on the DC terms metadata element set, the open core metadata set. And uh, we're not using the, meta, the DC terms mappings in this migration because uh, we feel that, especially in some cases uh, that I just described with the specialized metadata from faculty, we, there's no mapping, first of all. Second of all, uh, we're kind of losing, we can lose information if we map to Dublin Core and then map up to a more granular schema, mods. So we're skipping that. And what we're doing is taking all the fields in a particular collection, as you can see illustrated on the left, and as part of the tool, which I'll describe in a second, allowing um, a metadata expert to configure a template that is used to create the mods record for the, that item during its migration into Islandora. So they have to learn a little bit of XML markup, but that's all they have to learn um, to do this. We feel this is gonna be an effective way to, to uh, allow us to migrate kind of on a one-to-one on -one basis the elements that are in our content DM collections into mods, and to also allow the metadata experts to uh, establish sensible values for some of the elements that get into the mods uh, in these templates. So moving on to the tool development, and uh, the first one that I'll describe in detail is this move to Islandora kit, as we're calling it, MIK. Um, and I'll describe that next. I'll describe a couple others of these tools that we have developed or are in the process of, of developing as well. And all of this, kind of getting back to the, the community that um, I think all three of us have mentioned, but I mentioned at the beginning as well, uh, we are writing these tools from the ground up as open source, as GPL3, uh, which is the same license that the rest of Islandora uh, uses, uh, w w knowing that we want to release them to the community. Uh, some of them are pretty specialized and may not find many implementations in the community, but we're writing them not for ourselves only, for ourselves first, but we're writing them for the whole community. So the MIK is a set of uh, command line tools for generating Islandora import packages or ingest packages. Islandora has three, currently three uh, tools for ingesting batches of content. One that is, um, uh, they're all command, command line tools with also with a web interface. But I'll be focusing on the command line aspect uh, here. Uh, one tool uh, is called just the batch, in, the batch ingest module, and it, it ingests objects that have one file. So a, a PDF, a video, uh, an image. The second one is called book, book batch, and it ingests book objects. Uh, and the third one, which is uh, uh, fairly new, is called the newspaper batch, and it ingests newspaper issues. Uh, and I think, Christian, you alluded to a generic batch ingest process for the manuscript collection uh, solution pack. Right, so that's something that we need to yeah. develop. So we have a one-off solution, like you mentioned, for our organization, yeah. but we'd like to expand that so others will be able to do it a lot easier. Well, we should talk because I think we, we need to develop a compound object in okay. batch ingest and it may be similar in some ways. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so the way this works is um, because there are these robust and well-proven tools for ingesting these kinds of content in Dylandora, our tool just takes your stuff and cr converts it into these packages. It doesn't do the ingestion or importing itself, it just takes your stuff and moves it over to Islandora formats for ingestion. Um, so we're kind of, it's on the production side and the organizing side of the, of the content, uh, including creating metadata uh, file, uh, XML file, and by default mods, but you can um, configure it so that it can create any kind of metadata uh, XML file you want. 
Um, the initial sources that we will be using are ContentDM and uh, CSV files with local file system files. And we're creating it so that it is easily, easily extensible by a programmer. I mean, you need a de developer to write some code, but it's built so that they can do that very easily using well understood patterns of, of uh, PHP software development. Um, I won't go into this in much more detail because I already have kind of uh, uh, talked about it, but this is the tool that will, um, again, in essence, let our two w Drupal sites that use the Content DM API to continue to work after we've stopped using Content DM. So we're just basically emulating the Content DM API in Islandora. Um, and uh, I know you can't see that diagram, but it just kind of illustrates how this should, should work. Um, again, we will likely migrate those sites to Islandora in the near future, but not by fall 2015, which is our timeline for the, the large migration. Um, this is an interesting module. Uh, one of the benefits of Islandora is because it's, it uses Drupal for its uh, ingest display and kind of workflow management, is in many cases you can inherit a lot of the really, really rich uh, Drupal uh, module ecosystem. And uh, you have to, because Islandora doesn't use all of Drupal in a sense, you need to, you can't use all the Drupal modules in an Islandora site, but you can use a lot of them. And one very interesting set of modules in the in Drupal I, uh, community is called Feeds. And it lets you import various kinds of content into a Drupal site. So what we've done is taken Feeds and its rich tool set and kind of written some extra plugins for it that will make it work with Islandora. In essence, it will take, say, a CSV file uh, or whatever else you're importing um, and create Islandora objects, just like the standard feeds module in Drupal creates Drupal nodes or pages or Drupal users. And this module will help us with our biographical databases. Because they don't contain, currently in, in, our, in content DM, they don't contain book-like things and the metadata does not describe these book-like things, it describes people, um, we can use this as a way of migrating from that sort of flat database structure uh, into Islandora objects effectively. So that's, this is a, quite a neat merging of the Drupal ecosystem and a, a specific need for Islandora. And the last one I'll describe uh, is the uh, newspaper batch module, which we didn't write ourselves. We contracted with Discovery Garden to, uh, to write it for us. But as I said, we have 900,000 pages of newspapers, or more than 900,000. So we need an effective way of getting all that stuff into Islandora in a matter of a few months. Uh, and uh, this uh, module will help us do that. And because kind of a side effect of having uh, the service provider write this for us, is it kind of showed us how easy it is to write these import modules. So I think we'll uh, take a stab at the generic um, compound object importer ourselves, uh, of course collaborating with our colleagues at UCLA before we go too far. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, this is just another tool that um, kind of for the community that came out of our migration. Well, thank you very much for attending. It's our pleasure to uh, meet you today.